Were you very close to her yes. face? Method and time. Very well pronounced. <laughs> Thank you. And then take it. Clap. Clap. All right. Made a we're interested in hearing your perspective on the events that happened here in February in the Denmark community. Uh, but before we start, uh, can I just uh, have you introduce yourself, please? My name is uh, Mette Miriam Bento. Um, I'm born here in Denmark in northern Jutland in Tistel to a Jewish mother and a non-Jewish father. I'm married to Klaus, who's Jewish, and we have three children. What age? JJ or Jens Jakob, who's 14, um, Hannah, who's 12, and Elias, who's 8. Okay. Where do you currently reside? I live in Copenhagen. Okay. Can you describe your neighborhood uh, just I live, briefly? I live in the, by the lakes in Copenhagen. So I live in walking distance of the synagogue in a, in a very nice neighborhood. Um, it used to be called uh, the French quarters of, of Copenhagen, actually, because of the somewhat bohemian uh, um, neighborhood uh, with artists and cafes and restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We overlook our apartment, overlook uh, the lakes. Um, yeah. And it's in walking distance of the synagogues. synagogue. And mm -hmm. that means something to you, I, I reckon. Well, we, we live in walking distance of the synagogue because my husband is uh, Shomer Shabbat, which means that he will attend the service on, on, on Friday night and on Saturday morning and evening. And uh, since we used to live uh, so far away that it would take him 45 minutes to walk there, that's uh, somewhat of a schlep. <laughs> mm. um, and uh, it was important for him to get uh, as close as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you as a family, do you uh, follow him to the synagogue on normal uh, occasions? Sometimes, yeah. yes, sometimes. Okay. What do you do for work? I'm a personal assistant in an executive search company called Amrup, mm -hmm. where I'm the personal assistant for the managing director. For the managing director, mm -hmm. okay. So you found yourself obviously uh, back in February in the middle of, uh, of, of these uh, events that took place. Um, and obviously you were, uh, you heard about the shootings immediately uh, after it happened. Can you just describe what you learned, uh, wh what did you learn about what happened? Well, we were celebrating our daughter Hannah's bat mitzvah. Um, and uh, since the shooting happened after midnight, um, I'm tempted to say, thank God, uh, half the guests had left the party, everyone with small children, we had to go home to the babysitter, all the elderly. Um, and um, we were, uh, we divided the room into uh, a sitting area and a dancing area. And um, I was dancing with the girls, with Hannah and all her classmates. Uh, and some of the grown-up women in the in one room and uh, the security guard came in and asked us to stop the music and immediately after that he told us to run to the basement and so when we were in the basement he took my husband aside and gave him a radio and told him what had happened 
and uh, we were then taken to uh, to a safe room. And once in the safe room, my husband tried to. The children were obviously very scared and and worried and crying and upset. And um, my husband tried to calm everyone down, so he he lied and he said. Uh, don't worry, nothing has happened, this is standard procedure, we're all safe, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And at that point you didn't know either? At that point I didn't know either, but mm. I know my husband. Mm. Uh, and uh, I knew, both from the way the security guard had told us to run to the basement, and from something in my husband's body language, I knew something much different was going on. So I uh, pulled my husband aside. Actually, there was a, a bathroom. And I took him into the bathroom and I said to him, you, you need to tell me what has happened. So uh, he did. Mm. Okay. So a lot of uh, events happened uh, across uh, that period of time. How do you explain what happened that night and why? Well, when I try to explain it to my children who ask why does such a bad thing happen and obviously for them uh, they ask why does things like that happen to us or Hannah would ask why does something like that happen to me and my party um, or why does something like that happen to Dan? I say it's because of hatred. H hatred caused this. When you hate someone so much... Um, yes, I think it's hatred. And in your perspective, uh, what is the cause of this hatred? I think that there is a cultural hate, unfortunately. I think it's a mixture of things. I think it's, there's a, in Middle Eastern culture, there is a in-depth hate towards Jews, um, which is not necessarily a deep-rooted hate, but is more of a the boogeyman will come get you, if you don't behave, I'm going to give you to the... So it's more of a, of a yes, just an ingrown kind of hatred. Um, and I think that the conflict between um, Israel and the Palestinians is also a big contributor to this hatreds because people no longer distinguish between Jews in the rest of the world and Jews living in Israel and we are being held accountable for that. Um, and that is not only a Middle Eastern phenomenon. It's not only that the perpetrator, the terrorist was a Palestinian and therefore he had this cultural hatred and a hatred because of the conflict in the Middle East. Um, I think we also see that um, in the rhetoric being used in the left wing. Um, yeah. Did you, prior to the events in February, experience hatred towards you yes, as I Jews? Yes, I in personally. What, in in mm -hmm. what sense? Well, I've experienced several times. My husband wears a, a kippah, a yarmulke, um, all the time. I've, and he doesn't necessarily hide it. Um, and, oh, and why do you say that? That he doesn't necessarily yeah. hide it? Because other people I know who wear a, a kippah will take length to hide, to hide it, to avoid being identified as a Jew. Okay. So, so your, your husband experienced? My husband has experienced several times. He's had things thrown at him from cars driving by, sh people shouting at him, people spitting at him. I myself 
um, experience once when I had a uh, where I was wearing a Magen David. Sorry, I just. I myself. A star of, Di of, the, yeah, of David, yeah. Yeah, I was wearing a star of David, and and uh, and I was walking with my with my youngest in in his in his uh, pram, and uh, someone stopped, looked at me, looked directly at my Magen David, and then he spit right at me. Mm. Um, we've had when we've been walking with the kids, people shouting at us, people shouting "Go home to Israel," people shouting. Things in Arabic where we could make out what they were saying, except uh, something, something Jew. <laughs> um, my husband has experienced once he was picking up our daughter and our eldest son from school, going back home by bus, uh, a group of, of, of youngsters uh, standing, shouting at them, which obviously scared our kids a lot. Mm. In your opinion, um did this attitude towards Jews in Denmark has it uh, has it changed uh, um, in in the in 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 let's say in a period of ten to fifteen years? Is it a new phenomenon, or uh, or how far does this in relation to your own experience? When did you experience this the first time? Well, I'm born in in, in northern Jutland, as I say, in a place where. Um, the only Jew they have ever seen was my mother. Um, and um, when I was a kid, I was bullied a lot. Um, the kids used to say, go home to Jew land and other very obscene things. And that was out of ignorance. Um, they, might have a, they might have a strong opinion about Jews, but it stems from ignorance. They don't really know they don't really personally know necessarily anyone who's Jewish. They don't know anything about Judaism. They, they, for them, it might be a Jew, it might be an Arab, it might be a Muslim, it might be, I don't know, a Mormon. It's not necessarily this deep-rooted um, anti-Semitic uh, sentiment. Um, then I left Denmark and I, all through the 90s I lived in Israel. And when I came back, I uh, noticed that the, um, the, when you talked about Jews in Denmark, it was always in connection with the conflict in Israel, in, in the Middle East. And I heard many people say, if only the Palestinians and the Israelis could make peace, that was the mother of all conflicts. If they could make peace, world peace would immediately after that uh, would, 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 uh, would happen. And I, I experienced that people who have no connection to Israel, they have an extremely strong opinion about that. And that spills over because they don't distinguish between what happens in Israel, Jews in Israel, and Jews in Denmark, and we are being held accountable for that. So you see a development yes, towards I more accountability? Yes, I certainly do. Um, yes, mm. I, I, see, I see that... I see certainly within the last 10, 15 years mm. an increasing hatred towards Jews based or the arguments, maybe it's concealed as criticism of Israel, actually. Maybe it's concealed as, I have something against the way that Jews act in Israel, therefore I have something against Jews. And you should have some kind of, you should um, acknowledge that and you should say, I don't agree with what the Jews do in Israel. Mm -hmm. Though I never demand of anyone who's Arab that they say, I, I take a strong, uh, I strongly oppose um, terrorism made in the names of Islam. I, I know that not all Muslims... I mean, how can I hold, hold one Muslim from Jordan responsible for what someone from Iraq does? Uh, if, we, if we go back to the, the incident in, in February, mm. in the aftermath, uh, did you see any effect on the on the in the general population of Denmark in the general opinion about uh, Jews in Denmark in regards to the to the terror attack? 
How do you, how do you understand this? Actually, that was one of the worst things. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> Just take your time. So the question was whether you notice something uh, <clears throat> changing in the Danish society and their re reactions toward the, the situation. In, in the weeks after we received emails and phone calls and letters from people all over the world, Jews, non-Jews, Muslims, writing especially to Hannah, saying that nothing should take away, no heinous act should take away what was her great day and um, people wrote to me that I should feel no guilt, that I had no responsibility, that you know this great outpour of uh, comfort and support and that was wonderful. Unfortunately I also received and read and saw comments about how we brought this upon ourselves. And those comments were directly directed as you, uh, for you, directed at you and your family? No, it was directed as us as Jews. Okay. That the Jewish community had brought it on ourselves because we didn't strongly enough oppose to what Israel did, the genocide that Israel did against the Palestinians and And we, have, we had brought it on ourselves, and that if we didn't like this, the smell in the bakery, we could find a new bakery. And um, these comments came from regular Danes. They didn't come from Muslims. They didn't come from someone who... Um, they just came from a regular, regular Danes that... Yeah, they were well argumented, they were well founded in their arguments. Um, it was, um, it wasn't this, um, some of it was the, just this very, prof very profane kind of way to talk and just, you know, I think the, the it's called trolling on the internet. It's uh, it was obviously just people saying stupid things. But there were also all of these regular people saying that we were to blame for what had happened, that we should receive no extra help, that it was uh, a horrible thing that the police were now deployed to take care of us, that all the money that that would cost should go to something else, and why on earth should we... It was, it was so... It was really... It was hate. Really hate, um, yeah, mm. and extremely unpleasant. I can understand. Uh, how, does, how did this shape your understanding of your community in Denmark? Um, I think that the Jewish community took some actions in the month after that were uh, very wise. They they actually hired someone to take care of all the political aspects of being an interest group, being a minority in Denmark, which I think is something that we've needed for a long time. Someone to address politicians, because those people saying that we brought this on ourselves, you, how do you address them? You address them with the education, with the going out there and meeting them uh, mano a mano. You know, you, you, you need to, and, and you need to address this on a higher level. Uh, and I think the community um, chose to, to, uh, to hire someone to do that. And I think that was mm. the right move. decision. Yes. In a, in a, in a, um, 
a question a parallel to this question, a, 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 a track that I would like to start up with you, is just for you to reflect briefly on the influence of your background, your personal history, on the way that you cope with this whole thing. Can you, uh, can you, can you make a reflection on that? I think the fact that I am not brought up in a religious household um, and I chose actively as the only of four siblings to live a Jewish life. I did that because um, I always felt that it was an obligation for me to not be the weakest link in the chain. Uh, that when now my family had been on my mother's side had been Jewish for so long, who was I to to dismiss this? Who was I to be the one to say no? I don't want to continue that Jewish line. Um, that was very important to me from a very early age. Um, the fact that my husband also chose to become Jewish because he's converted, um, that meant something because we actively chose to be Jewish. And in the days after, we looked each other in the eyes and said, now, now we have to be even more Jewish. But as you reflect on it afterwards, in when once the shock has left, obviously I'm thinking I've chosen a Jewish life for my children, why we held a bat mitzvah, uh, why my sons are circumcised, all of this that are being I'm being pounded upon right now in the in in the media, um, and of course I have to reflect on whether that's the right choice or not. Um, whether uh, there is a Jewish future for my kids in Denmark? Am I raising my children in Denmark for a Jewish future? Is there a, is there going to be a Jewish future for them to have here, um, or are we going to have to leave? Uh, on, a, on a very uh, practical level, yeah. do you do things? different today than you did prior to the attack? Yes. What do you, for instance, what? When we light the Shabbos candles, we light every Friday an extra candle for them. Okay. And Hannah lights that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we often talk about how can we try and do some kind of good deed because our reflection is that we are alive because someone else died so that we could live. And that, uh, that's an obligation mm. to try and do something mm. for the sake of good. Mm. And uh, since the attack, our youngest son has been, um, he's, he's seeing a, 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 a therapist. He's uh, very, very afraid of being recognized as a Jew. He's very afraid to be shot, that if someone will recognize him as a Jew, he will be shot. And we have to deal with that somehow. And uh, besides, in a gentle way, um, but he's also afraid of, of anyone who's dark skinned. And it's very, very, very important for us that our kids do not hate anyone, regardless of their religion, regardless if they like them or not, because they're Jewish. So we try even now, even more than ever, we try and pe preach to our children, you know, that they be the better person, that they be the one who show kindness, chesed, that they show, because they are minority and they've now experienced how extremely vulnerable they can be, they have to show what they want other people to show them of consideration, they need to show that to other people. Yes. You explained earlier on that uh, you realized in the aftermath of the attack from reactions from the general Danish population that uh, some of these reactions surprised you in their well-argumented and uh, mm. uh, thorough uh, argumented response and uh, to this situation and their way of, of dealing with it, opinion about it. How do you explain that? Not that you got surprised, but how do you explain that this... Uh I think that's because it's, uh, it's become... It, on the left side of politics, 
uh, it has become acceptable. There's a certain rhetoric that has become acceptable. Um, and it's also become acceptable because of the media. And, um, well, these are very well-educated people. So why do you think it has become acceptable? I think that if something is said enough, it becomes acceptable. So if you repeat something that you believe to be the truth, then at some point it becomes acceptable. And yeah. Okay. Do you think anti-Semitism is on the rise locally, nationally, globally? I, I have no doubt that it is. And funnily enough, I think uh, one could speculate that since uh, the world economical situation has been really poorly, traditionally, historically, we've seen that every time the, econom the economy goes down, uh, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and all throughout Europe, I think we, you see uh, a rise in anti-Semitism. But I think you see it on two different levels. You see it among ethnical Europeans, and then you see it among people with a different ethnical background than European who now live in Europe. And I think that the two groups are also, in this globalization times, they are also intertwining. Mm -hmm. They are, thank God, um, becoming... Mm -hmm. But as a side effect of that, one opinion of one group might become the opinion of the other. Okay. How do the events of February have an impact on the future. I want you just to reflect on what is what are you most fearful about and what are you most hopeful about? I am most fearful on a from a Jewish perspective. I'm most fearful that there won't be a Jewish life for my kids to live in Denmark. On a as a human being as a Dane I fear that this will bring more hatred and division. On a personal level, as a mother, I fear what long-term effect that trauma has on my children. And I see now that for my daughter, how will she, as a 12-year-old girl, find a way to be the girl whose bat mitzvah ended in a terrorist attack? Um, and on a positive note, I see that there are more people trying to build bridges, trying to make a difference for something good. And my... Where do you see it? I see it amongst uh, some of the Danish politicians, for instance. I see that they are... I see it amongst some groups of Muslims. For instance, with the peace ring, or after there had been uh, attack at the Jewish butcher, shortly after the terrorist attack, where they wrote the uh, profane words on the, on the walls and smashed in a window, they went and they put hearts on, on the door there. I mean, that was done by, by uh, two Muslim women. In the uh, days after, I went to visit Dan's parents and I went to buy some food to bring along, as is Jewish tradition for a Shiva. And an uh, Ethiopian woman came up to me, sorry, a Somali woman. A Somali woman came up to me and she said to me, I saw you on TV and I just want to say, I'm so sorry for what has happened to you. And you must know, we don't all think like that. We need to do things together, then it'll be better. And she was crying and I was crying and it was, it was for me a really beautiful moment. Um, so. I'm hopeful for that. Mm. What would be, in order for you to make these hope, to make them re realistic, what would be your advice uh, from your opinion? That the silent majority needs to stop being silent. That um, we all try and make a little bit of an effort to be kinder. 
And um, I think that as a Jew, you have a responsibility to try and make a difference for something positive. I personally, on a deeply personal note, I think that that's why Jews are in the world. That's to make a positive change. That's our responsibility. And I think that's... If my daughter can meet a Muslim girl and they can become friends and they don't hate each other, that's one step in the right direction. Where do you, clear, in the most clear way, see these values of responsibility in the Jewish community? Well, I think that's a, it's a political thing because we have an organization representing Jews in Denmark and it's their responsibility. Uh, and I think they do that. I think our rabbi tries to um, prevent prejudice. He, he, he goes out and meet people and, and, and I see that our chairman is doing a fantastic job doing that. So I think it's, it's, it's in the works. Mm. More Jews could do more, mm. of course. Um, and in regards to the chairman and what, what he's doing, and what is it that you notice in the way that the way that he conducts himself or the Jewish community conducts itself. Well, Dan Asmussen is very, uh, he's a very, he's a very nice guy. And when he goes out and speak, people see just a regular nice guy, not a Jew with the teeth and, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he looks like and speaks, he's a well-argumented, well he's calm, he's, he's likable. Um, um, he's just a regular Danish dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, Opposite to a stereotypical understanding yes. of the Jews yes. in Denmark, how prevail, how much, how typical are these stereotypes of Jews in Denmark, to your opinion? Uh, I sometimes meet people that uh, look at me and say, but you don't look very Jewish. So obviously they have some kind of idea how a Jew should look. Um, so I haven't reflected on how that exactly, mm. how that look is mm. supposed to be. Mm. No. Mm. If um, prior to the attack, there was certain events taking place. One of the events was a gathering in the synagogue. After, uh, yes. After the attack, did, uh, did you attend this uh, gathering? I did. Okay. What do you remember the most from this gathering? What comes into your mind? Well, we've had a meeting for um, all the guests from the Bat Mitzvah party. We've met in the community center just an hour before that gathering. So we were... Uh, I remember thinking, we're in this together. This is a community thing. Um, I'm not alone in my, in my, in the way I have to handle this. But I also remember thinking that the guests at that bat mitzvah party, the Jewish community at large, at large, um, the Danish population, that it was kind of a tear cake. And I was on every tier somehow. So uh, you had many roles? I had many roles, I had many different platforms where I had to kind of deal with that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you dealt with it. Yeah. Um, can you re reflect on, on, on your experience? You, you've lived in different countries. Mm -hmm. Does that have a re kind of a, a explanatory power in order to understand how you dealt with it in this situation? I think that because I've lived in Israel for many years, um, I have a little bit of a different uh, than a regular Dane, uh, a different mindset when it comes to anything that's got to do with security. Uh, I think mo Jews in general have a bit of a different, and then Jews who've lived in Israel, yet again, even more, it's like it's heightened a little. Um, so, for instance, when my kids see suddenly that there are, their school is where there are normally a fence and wires and uh, you have to beep in and beep out and security cameras and security guards. Um, so 
that's that's a normal thing for these Jewish kids. When they suddenly see police everywhere, that's for them, it's just a comforting factor. Uh, and for me, certainly also. But then, of course, I... I I'm worried, did they have the right training? Do they know why they're standing, where they're standing? Are they alert enough? Have they got the proper training and profiling? Do they know who to target? Do they know who is a most likely a candidate to uh, suddenly take out a gun? Uh, so things like that, uh, yes. That, that has influenced my way of thinking, having lived in Israel, for sure. And do you think more about that in the aftermath of the yes. terror than you did before? Yes, certainly. But I also have to stress that I feel a tremendous gratitude at the same time mm. towards these police officers. I really do. Do you feel so safe? Do I feel safe? Mm. No. I don't think I'll ever feel safe again. If you were to say anything to the present world uh, in some uh, fashion watching this interview or segments of this interview, what would that be? That's a huge responsibility. Um, stop hating. And if you were to advise Somebody I on think a, on, <laughs> on how to stop hating. Yeah. Um, I think that if you meet people, if you meet people at eye level and truly meet other people with an open mind, I think that uh, that would bring about less hate. And even if you hate, you don't have to act physically on your hate. We all have prejudices. I think that's a human nature thing. I meet someone, he looks in a specific way. My brain makes me think certain things about that person. It's natural. It's, and that's okay. It's not that it's not okay. It's just that I don't necessarily have to act on every feeling I have, even if it's a negative feeling. Um, and I don't, I, and I just, I just don't understand that deep-rooted hate of Jews, I don't understand it. I don't. We did not kill Jesus. He was supposed to die for your sins. Mm. Let's move on. Mm. The Israel-Palestinian conflict is not the mother of all conflicts. It is not. But let's hope that they find peace. Let's hope that for the poor Israelis and the poor Palestinians, let's hope that. But let's not try and play the blame game and blaming me or my kids or shooting them doesn't make any difference for any Palestinian, on the contrary. So, yes. All right. Thank you very much for uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.